afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to be a part of this program. And I would thank Bishop Bondon to have me over with this and to talk about how cerebral palsy can be a factor in my domain, and that is anesthesia. Uh, we'd go back around 150 years back, a little bit of history, and maybe a little bit of a kind of a quiz. 1862, can you identify this person in the slide? This is Louis Pasteur, and he discovered pasteurization in this year. And this person is another Louis, and this is Louis Carroll, and he wrote Alice in Wonderland in this year. And it is the same year that Dr. William Little actually gave the name cerebral palsy to this group of disease. And coming to my domain and how this cerebral palsy can be a factor in anesthesia, and I'll take a cue from what Mr. Mitro asked me to do, and that is to answer a few questions. Can we provide anesthetics to this group of patients? Is it safe? What are the risks? And how does the disease affect an anesthetic? Can this disease actually get worse by an anesthesia? Does an anesthesia technique or its agents or the drugs possibly harm this patient? And how can we be safer while managing these patients who have cerebral palsy? To answer the first question, that can we provide anesthetics and is it safe, I would borrow a phrase that has been made very popular by this person. And the answer is, yes, we can. And since we can, let's figure out in what areas do these patients would need an anesthetic. They would need anesthetics to keep them asleep and sedated while they're imaging, whether it's brain, hip, or spine. And they would need anesthesia, sedation, a little bit of monitored anesthetic care when certain treatment or interventions are happening to treat their musculoskeletal problems by taking out pain or relieving their spasticity. Definitive orthopedic surgeries are quite often done in this group of patients, hip spike out as you can see over here, or tenotomies, uh, tendon lengthening, etc., etc., and in correction of orthopedic deformities. So they would need an anesthetic in this situation. Minor procedures can be quite tricky in this group of patients, like dental extraction, endoscopic procedures, and shunts. And things like squint correction, grommet insertion, cochlear implants, which are quite often done in this group of patients. These are specific things that are done in this group of patients, and, but remember, a patient with cerebral palsy can come up with an acute appendicitis, with a cholest cholecystitis, who would need a surgery then. So, yes, we need to provide anesthetics in this group of patients. Now, let's address the next question. Does the disease affect anesthesia? And the answer is a big, big yes. The problem starts the moment you see such a patient, and the biggest challenge is to establish the level of communication with this group of patients, and that, unfortunately, is very, very difficult. If you look at that girl, she'll not be able to answer a lot of questions that you need her to answer, and that is when you need to engage her parent, that mother, to answer not only questions relating to the disease, but that also kind of builds that communication level to, between you and the patient and the relative, decreases the anxiety levels, and develops a, some kind of a communication with the patient and the caregiver. It is a bothersome area because, unfortunately, whether you like it or not, they have a lot of significant comorbidities, and the way we risk classify or risk stratify patients in a scale of one to five this group of patients are often in the area of three in a, in a scale of five. And the main thing that bothers us is their problem with the lungs. They would have the stigma of the neonatal uh, uh, respiratory distress syndrome leading to lung scarring. We all heard that they have this problem with aspiration leading to aspiration pneumonia, chronic lung infections. There is this problem with this bony cage as you would figure in that middle uh, picture, which leads to restrictive lung disease. And all these 
can ultimately lead to a very, unfortunately, a bad scenario like core pulmonella. We also heard they have difficulty in chewing, eating, they have drooling of saliva, they kind of uh, drool and drown in their saliva, and they lead to a state of malnutrition and anemia, which can be bothersome for an anesthetic. And they have this huge problem with the gastroesophageal reflux. And in a, for an anesthesiologist, regurgitation and aspiration of gastric contents can be really bothersome. They have poor dentition, loose teeth, spasticity of the muscles of the face and mouth, dislocation or problems with the temporomandibular joint, and that can be really, really scary for any one of us who want to take care of the child's airway when you are put to sleep, when their muscles are paralyzed and you need to take control on the airway. But the main problem lies in their main defect, that is the musculoskeletal. You can see from this image on the left, the flexion deformities makes it very difficult to position these children on an operating room table. And even if you can position somehow, it's impossible at times to get access to their veins or to their arteries if you want to monitor them. And the another problem is they tend to lose heat very, very rapidly because there is a huge, large basal surface area compared to their age and we need to take control on their temperature control while they're anesthetized. Since their muscles don't contract well, and if the surgeons cut through the muscles, the muscles tend to bleed a lot more than usual. And this is our, these are things that we need to be aware of and to handle it if we are aware of them. Unfortunately, as we have realized, this group of patients are on multiple drug therapy. And a few of these drugs can be really, really bothersome. Anticonvulsants being one of them. They have a propensity to trigger certain enzymatic reactions, and by doing so, a certain group of, uh, group of drugs that we use, typically the paralytic agents, tend to be needed more or more frequently. But conversely, because they depress the central nervous system, certain of our drugs, which keep the patient asleep, either take longer time to wear off from the central nervous system, or there is a much deeper plane of anesthesia that is produced than normal in this group of patients. Antispasticity medications classically like something like baclofen will also kind of influence the neuromuscular blocking action of our paralytic agents. And this is again something that we need to be aware of. And even something very simple like a laxative that they're uh, prescribed can lead to electrolyte disturbances which again can play with the anesthetics. So the challenge today is to keep it safe, and that is by doing proper optimization, figuring out what amount of biochemical or physiological or the hematological changes that have taken place by doing certain tests, like your blood counts, your renal indices, liver function tests, and even a chest, a chest x-ray is a kind of a must to figure out how badly is the lung in, uh, affected. And in certain groups, especially if you are wary of cardiac problems, ECG or even a higher imaging can be necessary. Coming to optimization, can we make them a little better before we put them to sleep while they undergo a particular procedure? Yes. And the main area and the main thrust area is the lungs. Chest physiotherapy can improve outcomes significantly if they're done properly to remove the secretions and make the chest function better. Bronchodilators and nebulization again has shown to be of significant benefit when they're done preoperatively. And hydration is a yes and a must before these kids are taken up for any surgical procedure and any anesthetics. Preoperative antibiotics is a is extremely essential because more often than not they would kind of harbor certain lung infections and so you have to be very specific and this does not necessarily mean the antibiotics start with the induction of anesthesia but it is started much before. All preoperative medications it is wise that you start it and you continue it till 
surgery and more significantly it has to be the anti-convulsants and the antispastic medications. Intraoperative management and this is to, just to show you does anesthesia actually harm the disease process? The answer is a big no because all the drugs that you would routinely use for any anesthetic, maybe to anesthetize our chairpersons or any one of you, would be used in these patients without any harm. But only thing that we need to know is that certain anesthetics may be needed in a lesser amount than they would be for a corresponding patient without a CP. Monitoring again, we would do the routine monitoring as, it, as we would do for any other patients. And, but keeping in mind that we need to be aware that the temperature may drop, so close monitoring of the temperature and of the neuromuscular junction. Post-operative management. After the surgery is over, how do we manage these children? Where are they taken care of? Should we send them to the ward or should we send them somewhere else? Ideally, because of certain problems that they have, it is better that they are taken care of in a high dependency unit at least or in a critical care unit. Why do you take care of these children or these patients in a high dependency unit? Because we are worried as we realized about their oxygenation. So they might get hypoxic, so might, the alarm bells might ring, might ring over there and we need to take care of that. They can have hypovolemia leading to hypotension, fluids, we need more of that possibly in this, and that is needed to be taken care of right away, straight away. And as we discussed, they have a tendency to drift to hypothermic zones. And that is why you need to take care of them in a high dependency unit in the post-operative period. And again, I'll come back to the lungs. They have a very high risk of aspiration in the post-operative period a very high risk of atelectasis which uh, can happen in the post-operative period which needs to be picked up early and dealt with. Pain, this is a major challenge in the post-operative period with these patients and the challenge is because of this lack of communication and because of the lack of communication there's a real problem in assessing how bad the pain is. So the better technique is to use a continuous modality of pain management and not wait for the patient to develop pain and let you know that there is pain. And one of the better ways of dealing with pain is a regional technique that is using local anesthetics and blocks because not only does it take control of pain, but it also helps in relieving muscle spasms that can develop in the post-operative period, which is why blocks like the kidney caudals or uh, epidural blocks or even a femoral block for the lower limbs can be extremely helpful in taking care of pain as well as muscle spasms in the post-operative period. About drugs to control pain, it is wiser to use analgesics, NSAIDs or paracetamols instead of narcotics because you run the risk of over sedation, you run the risk of respiratory depression and you run the risk of cough reflex suppression leading to worse outcomes in the post-operative period. So with that, I kind of would conclude and say that yes, we can provide anesthetics to a patient with cerebral palsy. Yes, there is an issue that the cerebral palsy patient can have comorbidities which can influence an anesthetic, but no, no anesthetic agents, no technique can worsen the disease process and make it worse as long as you take necessary precautions and we do the right thing at the right time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for a very patient hearing.